Okay, Algebra 1, 0, 013, representing data, the last one of the pre-chapters. So, we're going to start off with what's a frequency table. A frequency table, guys, is just a table with tallies. So, it uses tallies, or tally marks, to display frequency, which we don't want to use frequency to display... number of times something's used. I'm going to say put number of times. The number of times something comes up, aka the frequency. So, a bar graph, guys, is a type of frequency table. And what it does is it allows you to group or count up how many times it is and then create a bar that will be able to like quickly access and say, hey, look, I can look at this data and say which one has more, which one has less, which one's in the middle, and possibly, if it matters how your bar graph is created, which one um, has a certain value. So a bar graph is the graph of the tally marks. So a graph of the tally marks, if you want to say that. Bless you. So, as our first example, I want you to make a bar graph to represent the data. I got a two-step approach there. The first step is draw and label axes. And then I want you on your axes, make sure you're putting that you're going by twos or threes or fives. Draw a bar reaching each individual indicated value. And so, if I was going to do this for this type of problem, I would sit here and I would label the top as in number of votes. Going on the y-axis. And I would label the bottom as drink. Now, this one might be a um, thing about... What kind of drinks do everybody like? So if I had apple juice, Pepsi, Coke, or milk for today for lunch, and I just wanted to take a quick tally to figure out how much I had to grab out of the cooler, I would just say, hey, guys, by a show of hands, how many people want apple juice today? Boom, we write down. Notice that every time we have there with a cross on it, that should be a five. And so each group here is worth five. And then we have our single digits after that, our tallies. So I kind of want to look here and say, what's the biggest tally marks? Which one has the most? Because that's what's going to kind of gauge what we should go on for our sides. The biggest one is, I think, Coke, right? Wait, 5, 10, 15, 19. So we probably should make our graph maybe go all the way up to 20. So when I go over here on my scale, I'm going to go by fives. 5, 10, 15, 20. So 5, 10, 15, and 20. Across the bottom, I am going to put all of my different categories. And those categories were apple juice. I'm going to put AJ, apple juice, P for Pepsi, C for Coke, and M for milk. All we have to do then is make a bar that goes as high as it is. Apple juice goes to 15. So, apple juice, I make a bar that goes up to 15 and back down. Pepsi, it only goes to 11. So I'm going to go just above 10, back down. Coke goes up to 19, just below 20 and over. And milk goes to 17. So when I look at this, if I walked into the room and I saw this graph, you'd be like, oh, what's the tallest column? That's the one that's used the most. That's Coke. Most people want Coke. The least favorite is Pepsi of the group. 
Easily done. Our cumulative frequency is just a frequency table, a bar graph, but you put things in categories. Categories. Wow. So it's categories. So we might group it as like, okay, if I'm going to start, you know, talk about population and ages. And we might talk about how many people are between the ages of 0 and 5, 6 and 10, 11 to 15. So we can group people into categories. That's what a cumulative frequency is. And a histogram is basically a bar graph, but instead of separating your bars like we did in that last problem, I think they usually just kind of stack them on top of each other. So that's more kind of a difference. A line graph is where you have points. You plot points and connect the points. Um, plot points and connect. Each one of these, whether it's a bar graph, histograph, cumulative frequency, line graph, they all have their positives and negatives when you're choosing to, to make them. Um, reason the thing did wasn't there so we'll, we made, I just made some up. We'll just do six days. We'll make a line graph of this first six days of work. And uh, so on day one, two, three, four, five, and six, he works eight, six, seven, eight, five, and ten hours. So what we're going to do then is plot all of those points. And then we'll just connect. And so make sure to label your axes. And so on the bottom, we're going to put days, or the day, and on the top, we'll put hours, or along the left side, the Y column. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six days, and the max hours he works is 10. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We'll put one more on there. So then just plot your points. 1, 8, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, this is 5, this is 10. So 1, 8, 2, 6, 3, 7, 7. So I finished it off. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to connect them with straight lines. And so you kind of get a little bit of a zigzag pattern sometimes. And you're able to identify this way as well that, you know, that he worked more towards the end of the week maybe than he did in the beginning of the week. Or you know that the last day or the sixth day he worked the most hours where on day five it looks like he worked the least amount of hours and you'd be able to figure that out as well. The next one is a stem and leaf plot, guys. Stem and leaf plots are great because they are all about taking large groups of data and making them or putting them in order very quickly. So above here we have the temperatures of 30 days. So you have 30 different numbers. So I'm gonna tell you, teach you how to make a stem and leaf plot. But first, I will make a cheating stem and leaf plot. So, what first is a stem and leaf plot? Well, a stem and leaf plot is two lines that looks like almost like the fourth quadrant when you're graphing, where you have your leaves across, going across here, and your stems are going across are going down. Everything should be in order. And so our stems always start off with our tens. Those are your tens numbers. What's in the tens position? That goes down the left column. We're going to cross is your single digits, your leaves. For the leaf. Now, what we're going to do is, I'm going to take this stuff away. I'll just rewrite it is you look for your lowest, smallest number. What's your smallest number in this whole entire group? 
I see a 72. Do we see anything less than that? 64? Do we see anything a lot smaller than 64? So find your smallest number. Put that stem in. The stem is a 6 for 60. What's your largest number? 80. I see an 82. Anything larger than 82? So if that's the case, I need a 70s and I need 80s. This one's going to be called a cheating stem and leaf block. So you only need 60s, 70s, and 80s. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in the beginning of that list, and I'm going to start putting the leaves in their appropriate row. So the first number is a 72. So I'm going to put a 2 in the 7 column, or row. Go to the next one, it's a 4. Then I go to a 2 again. Then I go to a 3. These are all 70s. 75. And then it goes 74. Now we're at 82. That means it's an 8-2. 80, put a 0. 82. Notice that I'm also trying my hardest right now to keep at least one number in each column spot. I'm not going to group them all together and make them look all So I'm trying to keep things as consistent as possible. I am at the second 82. Now I'm at 81. Then I go to 87. Is everybody following where I'm going? I'm just writing my leaves in the right stem spot. Now I'm at 64. Moving on. Where are we? 64. 70. 76, 73, I might run out of room here, 72, 76, 75, and then 74, 80, 81, uh, 82, right, 68, 69, 76, oh, this is going to be as part of this. The next one will be at 76, 2, 2, 7. That's called a cheating stem and leaf plot because a stem and leaf plot, all of those leaves also need to be in order. So to put them in order, I just create it again. I'll make it down here so it can be larger. We know it's going to be a 6, a 7, and an 8. And now I just go back and place an order. The 6s, that would be a 4, 7, 8, 9. The 7s, the smallest number is a 0. And then I count up. How many, do I have any 1s? No. How many 2s do I have up here? I have one, two, three, four, five. So five twos. One, oh, not fives. One, two, three, four, five. Then I go to threes. One, two, two of those. Fours. One, two, three. Fives, one, two, sixes, one, two, sevens, one, and then I think that's the biggest number, right? 67, there's no 68 or 60, oh, there's a 69, I thought, no, there's 60, 70s. So 77 is the highest of the 70s. And then we go back to the 80s and do the same thing. Two zeros, one one, and three twos. Two, two, two. The coolest thing about this is, which one's the biggest number? What are not the biggest number? You can find the biggest number, yes, that's 82. Smallest number is 64. You can also find the mode. 
the mode is the one that has the biggest the number of leaves. And it looks like the two is in the seven. So 72 is the most, or the mode. You can actually use this and find the median by working your way inside the leaves as well. That is a stem and leaf plot. Circle graphs, you just find the ratio of every item in the data, multiply that ratio 360, figure out how many degrees are in a circle, that's 360, so how much is it going to be used, and then you can use the fact to draw yourself um, using the degrees, use a compass if you need to, and a protractor to figure out how many degrees are in there. So, find the ratio. Well, to find the ratio, you need to say how many are there to the total. So we're talking about names of cereal and the amount of iron in the cereal. I guess this isn't the best. Let's just say that um, each one of those is the amount of milligrams of iron or something in it. This actually wasn't the greatest problem for this. But if I add all this up, 3 plus 5 plus 1 is 9, plus 4 is 13, plus 2 is 15. So that means there's 15 total. So then all I have to do is go back and say 3 out of 15 times that by 360. That'll tell you how many degrees of the circle is going to be used up. Or one-fifth of the circle. What's one-fifth of 360? Next one would be 5 out of 15 times 360. That one's a little easier because 5 out of 16 is a third. This would be 120 degrees. What is 360 divided by 5? Seventy two. Then it's one fifteenth times three sixty. Four fifteenths times three sixty. And then once you get those percentages, then you're able to, and this problem wasn't the best, but then you can basically coordinate off to find the percentage of each one.